Okay, so let us start. We are in this chapter of basic statistics. We have started this chapter in the last class. And so far we have covered bullet number one and bullet number two in the last class. And then we started with the concept of frequency distribution. Today we are going to cover uh, the remaining uh, topics. We might cover up to bullet number five or four. Let us see. Okay. All right, so let us quickly revise uh, before we continue with the today's topic. Let us quickly revise what we have seen in the previous class in this chapter. We know that the data and information are related. When you process the data, you get the information. Processing the data is nothing but information. So that brings the data in, in focus. So now we are focusing on the data. Because if we don't understand the data, then we will get something and that something may not be meaningful. So we need to know or we need to understand the data. And for data to have that hints for you to understand it, you need variables. And for that, let us take an example. We did some example in the last class. Let us take another example today. Let us say I have uh, such numbers. What are these numbers? Can you tell me? Is there a meaning if I if you have you know, 190, is there a meaning? No. So unless I give a so unless I give a label to those numbers, there's really no meaning, right? Now if I give this label height in centimeters, now I could say, oh, the first record he has a height of 190 centimeters. The second record, he has a height of 200 centimeters, so on and so forth. So now we have a meaning, right? Yes, and these labels, these hints that you have in data are called as variables. So to understand the data, the first and foremost step is to understand the variables. Variables are sometimes also called as fields, okay, and column headers and so on and so forth. But that is the one that will help us in understanding what we have in the data. Because if you understand the data, then we will move in the right direction to get the information. Now variables, they have type. They have type. Your, your variable could be numerical, or your variable could be non-numerical. In the non-numerical case, uh, in our course, we are dividing it into three you know, categories, like categorical data, ordinal data. In fact, actually, you know, it should be like this, categorical data, then it could be specifically ordinal or it could be nominal, okay? But again, this is, you know, uh, all non-numerical data. Sometimes the, the People in the literature, you can see nominal and categorical, they are the same. So you could have many uh, you know, the variations, but again, this is a rough guideline that you have categorical. Any data which is not numerical is categorical, which specifically could be ordinal or nominal, or could be just categorical, okay? So these are the types in which the variables can come. Uh, dealing with numerical is a different way. Dealing with non-numerical data requires some different knowledge. So we should be able to identify that. The second thing about variables is the terminology. The variables, they have terminology, which is whether they are input variables or output variables or auxiliary variables. The input variables are those that goes into your method. For example, let us say you have a method called regression. Okay, you have a method called regression. Then all the input variables will be input to the regression. And the output of the regression will be the output variable. Okay. And some of the variables we don't even consider in the analysis. Some of the variables we don't consider them in the analysis. And those variables are called as auxiliary variables. And this is all what we have seen in the last class. 
Any questions, any comments? Okay, all right. Then let us start with the topics of today's class, which is frequency distribution. We started this topic just like a, we touched this topic in the last class and we stopped. So when you have data, you would like to have a picture of the data. So what do I mean by picture? Picture means a graph, a plot of the data. And that picture of the data might give you more understanding of, about the data. It might give you details or information which is not readily available when you look at the numbers itself. So picture can enhance your understanding and give you some insights about the data. And one of the popular pictures, uh, and actually we'll see two in here and then we'll see more later, uh, is coming from the frequency distribution. So for each data, we see how many times, for each value of the data, we see how many times it's being repeated. And that number of repetitions, the frequency, can be plotted in different styles. If you plot it like bars, like you know rectangles, just depicting the number of times things have occurred, then it is called as histogram. Uh, if you show it in the proportions, in percentages, then you have pie charts. So there are two different pictures that we're gonna learn about the data that can enhance our understanding of the data. So let us start with this picture. Uh, here you have the data of two variables, student ID and subject. We are going to draw the histogram for the subject. Okay. Now this variable subject, can you tell me what is the type for this variable? It is categorical, that's right. Now what we do is we identify the unique values. Okay, we identify the unique values in this variable. Can you tell me what are the unique values in this variable? We have math, we have physics and chemistry. So three unique values. Now for those three unique values, sorry, it's given. So for those values, we count the number of times it is being repeated. For example, these are all the occurrence of math. And if you count them, there will be nine such occurrences. Similarly, you can do it for physics and chemistry. For physics, you have 13 occurrences. And for chemistry, you have three occurrences, okay? So for each of these unique value, you calculated the number of occurrence. Now on the X axis, you write those unique values. Now this is purely categorical. There is no ordering. There is no order that says math should be first then chemistry or physics. There's no ordering. And so you could put them in any order. But if there is an order, then you have to put them in that order, okay? Usually in the increasing order. So now we kept math, physics, chemistry, and next to math, I will make a rectangle, and the height of the rectangle is some 19 units. 19 units relative, some units, maybe 19 centimeters or 19 something. But using the same units, I, I make a rectangle for physics, which is 13 units, and for chemistry, which is three units, okay? Like this. So nine, in the same scale, it will be 13. On the same scale, it will be three. And this is a picture of this data. And this is a simple picture. It is called as histogram, histogram of this data. When looking at the data, you might not see things so obviously, and you can think so obviously here. For example, I could see that the number of students who selected chemistry is way less compared to math and physics. And math and physics are almost close, but physics is the highest. This information I cannot get by looking at these numbers. Maybe with 25 numbers, you can do it. But imagine if you have thousands of numbers, you cannot get it. But having a picture like this can help you to get an overview, to get a better understanding of the data. And this is the first picture for, for this data, which is histogram. Uh, any doubts, any questions? Questions, comments, anything not clear? Okay. So that is how you draw the histogram for 
categorical or non numerical data so you know roughly speaking categorical non numerical is the same but sometimes you have special categorical which is ordinal or nominal and for all of them if you have ordinal data if you have nominal data for all of them this is the same style this is the same style to draw the histogram now when you have numbers when you have numerical values then the histogram is slightly different for example look look at this uh, picture here you have a variable score this is a numerical variable okay and how do you know it's numerical variable what is the type of this variable score yeah so this is one like an acid test okay numbers is not enough you could have numbers but like student id for example student id this is all numbers is it numerical this variable student id is it numerical no what it is it is nominal right this is a nominal type so here having numbers doesn't make it numerical what makes it numerical is you can get things out of these numbers for example and the easy way to know is the uh, the mean like you know, kumail said okay so average yeah so the average score does it make sense yes the average score you have you know you have a student 25 students the average score of the student makes sense it has some meaning but average student id it doesn't make sense average student id of 25 it doesn't make sense right so that is the difference so having numbers doesn't qualify it to be numeric please remember that so this is a numerical data and the mean ha has some meaning and uh, we can use that as as our you know um, reference to to make it you know to call it numerical data now for numerical data we can do the same method that we used for the categorical data I can calculate the unique values for example let's say 75 is a unique value 81 is a unique value 82 is a unique value 83 is a unique value and then for each of these unique values i could calculate the occurrence but there is a problem it is it doesn't make sense you know 81 82 it is the difference of one point should we treat them as a different category altogether uh, maybe not because you know these are scores so one point difference in treating them as a different value altogether might not make sense yeah so that's the idea that's right kumail so we like to group them at least so that the numbers within the group are almost similar okay we like to group them and that grouping is called as bins b i n s okay that grouping is called as bins b i n s bins okay so here and how to come up with the bins well you could look at the minimum value maximum value and then you can divide it into given number of uh, bins or from the beginning you can say okay i will go from 71 to 80 or 71 to 75 76 to 80 you can come up with your own cutoffs and bins okay once you have these bins once you have these bins then it is exactly same as the categorical uh, histogram for each of these bins you will see number of values that fall into these bins for example 71 to 80 let us highlight all the bins that we have and all the numbers that we have in this bin so 71 to 80 including 80 is inclusive okay 71 to 80 it is inclusive so you see here we have how many values that fall in this bin yes and similarly you can get for all the others okay you can get for all the other bins once you have these values we can create the histogram on the x-axis you will have bins on the x-axis you will have bins now do you think the order matters or can i just have uh, anything anywhere on the x-axis like before you had math, phys math physics chemistry you could flip it flip them and, and move things around but here, do you think the order should matter? Yes. Yes, the order should matter because you know this bin should come before this and this should come before the last one. So yes, the order will matter. 
and you have those bins with those you know ordering i can use a picture to, to show the bins and for this bins you write draw the boxes and the height is eight units 12 units and five units in whatever units you, you have okay and that is the histogram of these and from the score you might not be able to see it but you can see that the number of students uh, in 91 to 100 is less compared to the other uh, ranges and the highest number of students than you have is in the range of 81 to 90. so that is how the histogram is built yes uh, do you mean if we flip uh, this one uh, you will be the 8 and 12 and 5 and the x-axis and the 71 to 18 and the y-axis this is fine i no no i didn't mean that what i'm what i meant was this for example can you have here instead of this like this 81 to 90 71 oh, okay, to okay, 80 okay. 91 to 100 so this is not right why because you know there is an order this range should be the first one and then this range then this range so you not this yeah but from the y axis it's okay yeah, yeah, you can rotate it. Basically, you're saying to rotate it, right? Yes, you can do that. You can rotate it, and you could have a picture like this, 71 to 80, 81 to 90. And by the way, you know, again, it, 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 you should have some uh, okay, style. Okay. okay. All right. So that is how you draw the histogram for the numerical data. So remember, for numerical data, you need to think about bins. And if you change the size of the bins, you will have slightly different, you know, uh, histograms. And the right size of the bin is something that you should get. Uh, it will be, you know, there's no formula for it. No, no formula for it. Maybe with experience, you can uh, select a right size for the bin. Okay. So that is how you draw the histograms. Another interesting picture that you can get from the data is the pie chart. Is a pie chart, okay? So pie chart, it's similar to histograms, but histogram shows you the occurrence. It shows you how many times the value is repeated. The pie chart, it shows you the frequency or the proportion, okay? The proportion or the percentage, yeah. The proportion or the percentage of the occurrences. So for example, if you have, let's say some data, so you try to draw it in a circle, okay? And you, let's say, uh, maybe you, you have the same, let's say, subject, but not this data, but the same subject, math, physics, chemistry. Let us say math takes 50%. So half of this will be given to math. Then let's say uh, next 25% is given to the physics. Let's say you have chemistry, English. So each proportion uh, is represented by a, a sector, a pie. Okay, that's the name pie chart okay, by a sector, by a pie on this circle. Okay, and that's the pie chart. Sometimes if you take all the unique values, you get a full circle. Sometimes you, you might not get all the full values. So you get some circle like this, semi-circle, semi -circle, okay? Not semi, sorry, uh, incomplete circle. So you could have a pie chart which is incomplete. If, if you don't take all the unique values, then it will be missing, okay? So you'll have pie chart. Now, pie chart is another way to look at the data. It is also a very popular uh, type of chart in business and economics uh, uh, you know, majors. And it gives you a good intuition about the data. Okay. So let us see how to draw this pie chart. Let us see how to draw this pie chart. So again, the same story, you have the data. Uh, for each of the data, you will get the frequencies, the occurrences. Okay. And from the occurrences, you need to get the proportion. So can you tell me how to get the proportion of math? How to get the proportion of math? Yeah, 9 divided by total. Same thing for physics, chemistry, uh, for for. for, for for physics, it is 13 divided by total. For chemistry, it is three divided by total, okay? So here you get for 36%, 56%, 12%. So what it says is now in the, in the circle, yeah, you know, 
percentage, if you want percentage, you multiply by 100. Otherwise, you can just have 0.36. It is fine. But what it says is, uh, if you have the circle, more than half of the area should be given to physics. Then um, more, 36% of the remaining area should be given to math. And then the remaining uh, area should be given to the chemistry. So for a circle, they represent, represent pies of different sizes. So this is like almost 56%. This is like 36%. This is 12%. And you can depict them in a, in a actual circle. Uh, with different percentages for math 36, for physics 52, for chemistry 20. And that is the pile chart of this. That is the pile chart of this. In the histogram, we never saw this picture. We, now we see that more than 50% of the students like physics. If you see the previous picture of histogram, let me show you this picture here. Uh, we, we saw that students who like physics were uh, good in number. But now here we get another picture. And in this picture, we can see that the students are more than 50. Uh, by the way, this should be, I think, uh, 52, yeah. The students are uh, more than 50% who likes physics compared to math and chemistry. So histogram and pie charts, they give us different you know, levels of information, okay? Now this is how you draw the histogram and, and pie charts if you are drawing them by hand. And very rarely we do this nowadays. We don't draw these things by hand, but instead we use a software. So let us see how to draw them using our Python. Okay. So here is the data given to us: student ID, score, subject, and one to twenty-five. Okay. Now first, tell me how many variables you see in this data. Number of variables you see in this data. Okay. I have one answer: three. One answer with 25. So let us see again. Is it three or 25? But the good thing is most of the guys said three. So here it looks like there are 25 columns. And those 25 columns looks like uh, 25 uh, different, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, variables. But no, remember, we have records and we have variables. Usually, the row should contain the records and the column should contain the variable. But here, because of the space, we flip the table. So the variables are these student ID, score, and subject. And you know, for student number eight, these are all the values. For student number 16, these are all the values. So the records are shown in the column. So the table is flipped. And if the table is flipped, that doesn't mean you have 25 variables, okay? It is still three variables and 25 records, okay? Osama, is it clear? Okay, so it's three variables and 25 records. So now first we, we you know, get the data in our uh, Python. So we are gonna use lists of Python. And here are those two lists, subject and score. Now we'd like to draw. Okay, now, now we'd like to draw the histograms or uh, pie charts, whatever is being asked. For making any plots in Python, one of the basic library, again, we are not gonna code everything from scratch, right? We are going to use the libraries and from the libraries, we use the right functions to do the task. So the basic library for plotting in Python is matplotlib. It is matplotlib. And specifically in the matplotlib, we need pyplot, okay? So that is our basic um, library. So let us see what we need now. All right. So we say, you know, import matplotlib.pyplot, and we can stop there, or you can, make an acronym and usually it's the best to have an acronym so here we have a short name for this alias you can see our short name which is plt by the way this plt for matplotlib pyplot is this almost like a standard okay so here you have a, a plt representing matplotlib.pyplot and in this 
plot plt you have various functions for drawing the basic structure of your plot is like this plot dot figure to sh to have a canvas ready some place where you can draw and then plot dot show to show whatever is is done <clears throat> When I execute this, I, I, I see that there is a figure that has been created with this particular size, and you know there is only one axis. So zero axis means you know there is uh, just an empty figure. Okay, it's an empty figure. Now, when you draw plots in in Jupyter notebooks, there are different ways to draw the plots. If you want the plots to appear below your code, not popping out, or not in a new uh, Panel, but in the same uh, panel, uh, just below your code in this in the output of this cell, then you have to write this magic command. What is that magic command? Matplotlib inline. Okay, matplotlib inline. So that is the magic command. You have many magic commands in Jupyter Notebook. All of them just start with this percentage sign. So here you have percentage matplotlib inline. So what it does it, it shows that the plot is shown below in, in, the, in the output cell of the Jupyter notebook. Because I have executed this command in the previous class, even if I don't write it, it remembers that. But let us say I start the kernel, I start the notebook from scratch, okay, first time. Then this is must, otherwise you might not see the plot. You might not see the plot because the system might get confused. Do you want the plot to be shown here or in a different panel, okay? Yes, Faisal. Um, but I have a question. If you started from scratch and you typed the first line, okay. After that, in line five, you imported. Mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, the first command? Is this from the import? Is this from the library, or is something from Python? The first command. No. It's from uh, this the is, library. Yeah, this right? is from the Jupyter notebooks. Yeah, this is from the Jupyter notebook. So even if I don't import it, it's there. No, you can... this is from the Jupyter notebook. Okay, mm -hmm. this is not from the library. Sorry. Yeah. You oh, can okay. write this first, and you can import it later. No problem with it. So there's no problem if I executed the first line okay. without the so, library, right? Because I yes. saw it. It's like no the problem. Uh, yes, no problem. Yeah. This is the magic camera. Okay. Yeah, there is no problem. Uh, you can import it later. This is a magic command for the Jupyter notebooks. Okay, so it's it has something with the Jupyter notebook, and this is the library we are loading it later. It is fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just got confused. Thank you. Okay. All right. And there are two styles to to show the plot in the next uh, output cell. One is the inline style, the other one is the notebook style. And we'll see both the styles in a minute. Now, between plot figure and plot show, you actually write the code for your plot. To draw the histogram, the code is very simple. Just give the list or the array containing all the data values, okay? So here I have a list of all the data. So I'm gonna give that as an input to plot.hist. Plot.hist is for the histogram. It needs one argument, one uh, positional argument, which is must, which is the array of data, okay? And now I have the histogram here. I could change the size of the plot if I want. Uh, for example, let's say I want to have uh, maybe X axis shrink and you know, like that, so three, five, so it is something like this. I could shrink further if you want to, to make it, you know, in like this, okay? Or if I want to ready the um, Y axis, I could do that. So depending on the requirement, you could play with the size to, to have different uh, shapes of, of the plot. The other, you can see uh, style of, of plotting is notebook style, okay? Notebook style is also a nice style. Uh, here it, you have some nice options. You can, you know, change you can you know move things around or you can zoom here and there and these things can be done in the notebook style uh, but it is a bit bulky and if you have less ram it might get stuck 
So it's your choice. Uh, usually we prefer the inline one, which is the static plot. You cannot change it. There's no way you can change it. And you can save it as an image in your computer. But if you want to have an interactive plot, you can also use a notebook style, OK? Yes, uh, yes, you can use array. Actually, it is designed for array, but you, the list are also acceptable. So when you send the list here, uh, it is taken care. But yes, arrays can be used. So wherever list can be used, array can be used. Okay. But vice versa, opposite is not true. So if you want to have an array there, a list cannot be used. But if you can use list, array can also be used. So um, yeah, that's how you draw the plots in Python. Um, this is the basic library. Upon matplotlib, you have many more libraries, but this is the basic library. Yes, Faisal? So the first command, uh, it indicates the size, right, of the figure. Yeah. The x-axis and the y-axis. You mean this? This one, yeah, yeah. This one, right? Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to write this. It could be empty, so it will be default size, whatever is the size. But hmm. if you want to specify your size, you can specify it here. Okay, so the second one okay. uh, is for the uh, for the lists or the array. Yeah, the second one is actually plotting. It's for plotting, okay, right? Yeah. The histogram, you can have your list or array, it is fine. Yeah, it is actually, this is actually plot, yes. Uh, what about the last one? It just shows as it uh, is the name. It is to show. It is to show this plot. Yeah, it is to show this plot. The last one. It is to show this plot. Okay. Yeah. If I don't write it, you are getting so many things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But when you write these, uh, you get a plot. Okay. okay, I understand now. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if I want to, uh, to change it to uh, pie chart. No, you cannot do that. And we have an example for pie chart. It's not straightforward. Uh, and we'll see different ways to, or maybe we'll see how to create the pie chart. Okay, so just wait for question number four. Any other question? Okay, if not, let us see how to do the question number two, which is draw the histogram of the score. Okay. So here I could just, uh, yes, yes, you can use help. And I know this is something that uh, you should always do. Help for any function can be done, okay? Help for any function can be done. And always uh, have this practice of using help. In the exam, you will have, you know, uh, Jupyter Notebook given to you, a uh, system with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and the help is the one that you can always do. Uh, the, uh, the notebook extensions might not be available to you in the exam. Notebook extensions is for your convenience. Maybe in the exam it will not be there. Uh, but this help function will always be there. And I know I'm using the scratch pad for the help. Uh, but like we discussed, you know, you know, for example, let me add a cell here. Uh, I could use help anywhere in my notebook. Okay. And I could get all the details. Okay. So please uh, have this practice of help. Use the help, and uh, it should be, you know, handy. All right. So now, yeah. Now let us see how to draw the histogram for the score. So I could remove the subject I don't want, maybe. OK. So I could do the same thing, right? I could give you. But remember, there is a difference in the way we draw histograms for categorical data and numerical data. Can anybody remind me what's the difference?
here the bins so when you have numerical data we have to tell the system the bins sometimes you could just give a number for example say okay use four bins that's it so he will use four bins and then plot the histogram okay sometimes the bins are given to you like specific bins for example here it says 71 to 80 81 to 90 91 to 100 so if you have such specific bins you can write it here okay so 71 what it means is the first bin it starts from 71 including 71 and stop 81 which is in this case 80 okay the second starts from 81 including 81 and stop just before 91 and the third bin starts from 91 and all the way till the end. Okay. So that is the only difference you have. And then you get this plot. Uh, the figure size is too small. So let us make So that is how you can uh, draw the histogram for the numerical data. Like I said, for numerical data, identifying the right bin is one of the things you will learn by experience. And here is an example to show that in question number three, he says just to make the bins 30. And if you make the bins 30, you will get a completely different picture. So that's a picture for bins three, and that's a picture for bin 30. Let me make it at the same size, five by five, so you can see. Okay, so that's a five by five picture, and here is five by five. So they give different uh, resolution of the data. And too many bins is also not good and having very few bins is not good so finding the right number of bins that makes sense requires some practice some experience and then you can you know use those right number of bins okay all right now we move to the last um, question here which is to draw the pie charts for subject okay for this subject now to to draw the pie chart okay, to draw the pie chart let us have a look at this histogram first so histogram contains so many keyword arguments okay but then you have x which is what array of input values okay this is an array of input values now there is also similar command for pie charts for pie charts there is this again the same thing one positional argument and so many keyword arguments so those are you know optional and you can leave it no problem but here if you look at this positional argument it is not the array of the input data it is the wedge sizes so basically what it needs it's the percentage for example here if you remember we calculated the percentage here 36 12 and 52 so this is what he needs the wedge sizes the percentages uh, or you can say the value counts at least 9 13 and 3 for each of this for math it should be 9 for physics 3 13 and chemistry 3 so this is the input that it needs so we have to come up with our own way to get the inputs so how to do that well here let us have the code here first let me copy the subjects okay. so this is the list that i have can anybody tell me how to calculate the in this list how to calculate the number of m's in this list Okay, dot count. Okay, so if I write a dot count, and let us say here, write M, let us see what I will get. Okay, I'll get the number of M's. This is one way. Okay, I can use loops, that's right, I could use loops. Uh, how about using NumPy? If, if I create this as a NumPy array, that's what I did here. So let us use 
By the way, you could have different uh, things to code, uh, different ways. So let us say if I create a NumPy array, okay, then how to do that? Yes, we could do the mask, and then we could do the sum of this. Okay. So here we have two different styles of, of catching the number of counts for M. Similarly, you can do it for physics and chemistry, but I don't want to do it manually. So I would like to know what are the unique values. I know, you know when I look at it, I know math, physics, chemistry, but I would like to know the unique values from the program itself. Do you know a mechanism to calculate the unique values? Okay, using NumPy, it is straightforward. You have this NumPy.unique. NumPy.unique. Unique values. For example, here you have math, physics, chemistry, CMP, the unique values. But without NumPy, do you know how to get the unique values? Anybody in the class? Well, if I use set, also I get the unique values, okay? So you have so many ways of doing things. Uh, uh, way to go, again, this is completely your choice, but NumPy, having you know, knowledge of NumPy make things easy because these things are very general. I know these are very specific, but you know, NumPy makes a lot of you know, general things. So uh, we are gonna use NumPy, okay? And now I could, I have in subject labels all the unique values, math, physics, chemistry. I could loop this, okay? I could loop this and come up with an array of all the value counts. For example, for subject in subject labels. Now here instead of M, I'm going to set this as a subject. And now, I will get the array of pre-93, where three corresponds to, you know, if you print it, we'll see. So C3, M9, P13, okay? I could give it as like, you know, value. By the way, this is not the only way, please. Uh, don't take that this is the only way. You could use using the count and set methods, fine. Um, the, following one style is not re required. You can follow any style, but you should get the same answer. And there's no way you'll get different answer, okay? So this is what is needed for the pie plot, okay? For the pie chart. So here it needs the counts, which is, I, I have written here value counts, but in the, in the slides, in the notes, I have written subject counts. So I'm gonna use subject counts, okay? This is the first input for the pie chart. Then, it needs the labels. Without labels, it will be just pie chart without much information. For example, here you see, it will look something like this. So labels will be maybe helpful uh, to know which is math, which is physics, which is chemistry, and you have those labels. Sometimes inside this, you'd like to show the percentages. If that is the case, you can use the auto PCT uh, keyword uh, argument. And here you could give percentile and then 0.2f, this 0.2f is your format. And this is like a float value, two places of decimals, okay? And then again, you have another format, percentage, with the, again, percentage. This is for showing percentage. So let me remove this and show you. This is what, if you want to have more decimal places, you could have more decimal places, okay? And then if you want to show the percentage, this is how you can show the percentage next to it, okay? And that is how you can have the pie chart. Okay. Any questions, any comments? Any questions, any comments? Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to show here is uh, different ways in which you can do the sum. Okay. Different ways in which you can do the sum. Uh, for example, here, So 
This is one way you can do the sum. Yeah, that, yeah, I wanted to show this. You could also use the numpy.sum or you can use this dot sum. Yeah, and all of them should give you the same answer. So you have different ways to sum a list in array, uh, especially the NumPy array. You can have different ways to do it. You can do a dot sum of that, or uh, you can say NumPy sum of that array or sum of that array, and all of them will give you the same answer. So whichever method you like to use, use. Uh, one thing is if you are using NumPy um, everywhere, this is preferred. Okay, and this is the same as the NumPy dot sum. These two are the same. And this one is for the list. So either go with this or the other one, okay? And these are different ways to get the unique values. So I'll write here to get pounds. So that is how you get the pie chart. So now we have seen two pictures, two ways to depict the data, histograms and pie charts. You can use it for any variable, for categorical variable, for numerical variable, for any type of variable. Now, what is the ultimate goal from these uh, pictures? You actually are interested to know the distribution of the data. For every variable, you would like to know what is the distribution. Because distribution gives you lots of information. Distribution gives you lots of information. And an easy way to know the distribution is to draw the histograms. That's the easy way. Rough way, but you know, like a shorthand, okay. And most of the time, you are interested in normal distribution. Again, normal distribution is not the must, but this is very common if you are coming from different disciplines that requires mathematical uh, or analytical models, you will see that one of the assumption is that the, the system or the data has normal distribution. So this is something very common, especially in engineering, uh, you will see that normal distribution is a common assumption in most of the theories. And that's why here we are you know, studying normal distribution. We would like to know if our data has distribution similar to normal distribution. And drawing the histogram should be enough to, to help us identify it. There are some formulas. There are some formulas that can be used to check whether it follows normal distribution or not. But visually also you can see. So to check it visually whether it follows normal distribution or not, you can draw the histogram. And for the histogram, you can see the center of the data. And all the data is distributed symmetrically around the center. So when you draw the histogram and everything is symmetric around the center, that's the first sign for normal distribution. If I draw a vertical line in the, in, in the distribution, both sides should be symmetric. If I draw a vertical line in the center, both sides should be almost symmetric. And the shape should look like a bell. You know, if you have, if you see the old, old days bell, this is how the shape should look like. So if that's the case, then yes, it is normal distribution. The data follows normal distribution. But it might not be the case all the time. Uh, you might get completely different picture from this, which is you know, typically what happens. Uh, and sometimes it might have a close related shape. Okay, So that is what uh, we can check from drawing the plots. Now, one of the ways the distribution could be distorted, could not follow the normal distribution, is to have skewness. And you will see that most, you know, if you draw the center, here there's the center line, the left-hand side could be negative um, side of the center, and the right-hand side could be positive side, okay? We could use the left-hand side is negative side, and the right-hand side is positive side. So when you draw the histogram, you might see a picture like this. And if you look at the center, most of the values are on the right hand side. You have lots of bars on the right hand side, very less bars on the left hand side. Okay, if you draw the center here. That means the distribution is positively skewed, positively skewed. 
in meaning you have lots of values on the plus side on the on the right hand side similarly you can have the negatively skewed distribution okay so you can have one you know, deformity from from normal distribution which is skewness the other deformity is the sharpness of this peak you could have very flat or very sharp peak and then that deformity is called as you can have the formula, uh, even in Python, these are inbuilt. I think in NumPy or SkyPy, you have this to calculate the kurtosis and the skewness of the data. Okay. But we're not going to go that deep because, you know, here normal distribution is just selected because it's one of the common ones to show that how things are different. And all we will learn here, or all that we learned here is visually, can we see if the data follows just to normal distribution or not? That's it. Or it, does it have some positive or negative skewness? or not okay but uh, in practice if you want to do this test to, to identify the best distribution for your data you have a complete uh, different you know uh, uh, distribution fitting uh, package that can be used to, to identify the right distribution okay here is just an idea how we can visually see if the data follows normal distribution or not that's it any doubts any questions Any doubts, any questions? Okay. Yes, Faisal? Um, so all of these are normal distribution? Or, or only the first one, right? No, this is normal distribution. Yeah, this is the only normal distribution. Yeah, this is positively skewed and negatively skewed um, okay, okay. distortion of the normal distribution. This is not normal, this is distorted. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it makes sense now, yeah. Okay. All right. So that is something about the pictures, how we can use pictures like histograms and pie charts and how we can use histograms to, you know, uh, check uh, if it is you know, normal distribution or not. But we also need numbers because pictures is, you know, what you can get from the picture, it depends on how you look at the pictures, okay? How you visualize the pictures. When you look at it, what are the things that you look in the picture is what you get. But sometimes we need some numbers in front of you, crisp numbers in front of you. And there are two uh, types of numbers that people are interested about the data. One is the center of the data, the other one is the dis dispersion, the range of the data. The center and the range could also give you lots of insights about the data. And you don't have to always do the pictures. You can look at the center and the range of the data, and that will give you a good uh, information about the data. When it comes to center, uh, we, what we have is the measure of central centrality, how to estimate the center of distribution. These are the measures of centrality. Given the data, Based on different contexts, you have different centers. You know, uh, we have different ways to calculate the center of the data. For example, the typical ones, the common ones that we're going to study are the average or the mean, the median, and the mode. These are the three that we know. We, we have many actually centers, uh, but these are the three that are very common. Even maybe in, in sometimes in high school, you have these maybe mean and median and mode, you'll see them. Uh, the mean and median, they are very commonly used for numerical data. When you have categorical data, mode is the one that is commonly used. But again, you can use for numerical data all the three. Uh, for categorical data, you can only use, uh, you can use mode. And sometimes if you can, you know, if you have uh, ordinal data, if you have ordinal data, you could also use median. You can arrange them and select the one in between, okay? But mostly for numerical, it is a mean and median, and for categorical, it is most. That's the typical thing, okay? Now let us see how these are calculated, mean, median, and mode. Mean is very simple, the average. You just add all the data points and divide by the total number of data points. That is the common mean, the average, okay? All right, now how about the median? For the median, to, to get the median, you sort the numbers, let us say in ascending order. 
and then you select the one that is in the center, the number that is in the center. If you don't have the number in the center, then you take the average of the two middle ones. And that is how you get the median. What about mode? For the mode, you calculate the frequency. For all the data points, you calculate the frequencies, like we did for the histogram. And the one that has the highest frequency is nothing but the mode of the data. So that is how you get the mean, median, and mode. That is how you get the mean, median, and mode. Now let us take some numbers and see how this works. And maybe you see, we, we try to see maybe the importance of that. And let us take some uh, numbers, OK? So let's say 1, 5, 2, OK, that was not what I wanted, 2, 4, and then 0, 6, OK? What is the mean of the of the above? Hmm? What is the mean of these numbers? This is zero, huh? Okay, it is three. Okay. What is the median? For median, you have to arrange the numbers. Here, luckily, the numbers are arranged. So you look at the middle number. What is the middle number? Oh, the middle is, is empty. So then what you do is you take the average of these two. What is the average of 4 and 2? What is the average of this? It is still 3. Okay. What about mode? For mode, you need to identify which number is repeated a lot. Here, all the numbers are repeated a lot. So mode could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, anything. Okay? It could be anything. Or we can say we don't have mode. Okay? Or anything could be mode. They have two different answers. Okay? So let us use the none. But if you use in Python, it will just pick the first number 0, and it will give 0 as a result. So it will give, if you have tie in mode, Python will just give the first mode. Okay? Or 0. Anything could be actually mode. Now, let us see how things will change when I add a new number. So in this list, I added 600. Now, what will be the mean? What will be the mean? Yeah, some number, okay. So you add all of this divided by seven. What will be the median? The median, the median will be four. And what about the mode? Again, the same story, right? Any number could be mode or you could say there, there, there exists no mode. Yeah, now you see which one of them changed a lot. Yeah, so mean is very sensitive to the outliers. And that's what it said here. Mean is susceptible to the presence of outliers. So if you have outliers, mean could change drastically. That's why a median is used when you have a feeling that the data could have outliers. If the data doesn't have outliers, mean is a good choice to find the center. But if you're not sure if the data has lots of you know, outliers, you see there is some noise, something, then maybe median is the best way to go because you see that there is not much difference in the median when you have this outlier, okay? Yeah. Now mode, uh, like I said, when you have numbers, usually you will end up with something like this. Very rarely you will have a mode. Most of the time it could be any number because they repeated the same, or we, maybe because you know uh, you, you have the same, you just pick the one with the lowest value, which is zero. That will okay. Uh, but actually, use mode when you have categorical values. When you have categorical, for example, you had remember you had math, physics, chemistry, math, math, math physics, chemistry. In that case, the mode will be different altogether. Mode now will be what? Hmm? 
well the mode will be physics is occurring only two times but math is occurring four times so mode should be math because math is occurring good number of times okay so mode is nothing but the number of uh, the that value which is occurring highest or the maximum number of times okay so that is how the mean and median and mode can be uh, calculated again this is by hand we are doing this by hand uh, we can use our uh, python to do it for us as well or you can use excel to do it okay so let us take an example and see here you, you are given with the data now how many variables you have in this data how many variables anybody with 25 this time uh, nav says 25 and kumail says 25 25 records okay kumail that's the right answer so 25 variables is not right right we have two variables student id and score and we have 25 records okay now the first question says calculate the mean median mode of this by hand so basically you just come do the computations you know use calculator or you know excel and do it so for mean, you just add all these numbers divided by 20 because you have 25 numbers. So sum of all these numbers divided by 25 gives you the mean. To get the median, how to get the median from here? Can anybody tell me how to get the median from here? That's the first. You cannot get the median directly. So here are the You look at the middle value right so here luckily we have a middle value which is 82 if we don't have this middle value then you'll have two middle values you take the average of those two okay so here we have middle value which is the median what about the mode for mode for each number you calculate the number of repetitions for example here you see 71 repeated once 75 repeated twice 81 repeated three times 87 repeated three times so if that is the case then what do you think is the mode yeah 81 and 87 okay 81 and 87 let us see how we can do the same thing using our python for python the mean and median they are straightforward you can use your numpy library and numpy library has a mean and median for mode the numpy library doesn't have mode so for that we need this sky p library sky p library I don't know why NumPy doesn't have mode. This is something very basic. It should have been there. But still, after so many versions of NumPy, still the mode is not part of NumPy library. Maybe there is some strong reason for that, uh, which I'm not aware. Okay. So given the score, uh, the data in a list, first we convert it to a NumPy array. And then for that NumPy array, you have dot mean or NumPy NP dot mean of score. Different styles. You could just write uh, array.mean and you should get the mean for the median you can have numpy median and then you'll get the median and for the mode uh, that's the only problem uh, you have uh, in in skype right now you have mode and this will give me uh, this mode from skype will give me the first mode and if you have here let's say a tie between uh, 81 and uh, if you remember what was it yeah 81 and 87 it will give only 81 it will give only 81 that's the drawback of this but there is a new uh, version of, of mode which is called as multi mode from the statistics library this is a new library statistics there you have this multi mode it is available in python 3.8 so if you have python 3.8 you can import uh, statistics library like this and maybe you can use this uh, uh, i think i have upgraded my uh, python last year it wasn't upgraded so let me check yeah i think it is not yet done yeah it is not yet 3.8 okay so if you have 3.8 you can also use this multi mode so I just use these commands and that's how I get the mean is this, the median is this, and the mode is this, okay? Now, the reason why I write this zero here is if I remove that, you see I get, uh, 
I get all of this. Okay. But actually, what I want is just this number. So this number is is part of uh, this one, right? This one here. So that's why if I write here uh, zero, then I will get that number only. Okay. So that is how you get the mean, median, and mode using your NumPy library. And for mode, you need the SkyP library. SkyP library is also a very good uh, library. Uh, it has lots of statistical uh, methods, functions. Okay. Yes, multi. It should do that. Multi mode should return a list. For example, for this data, you should get 80, uh, 81, and 87. Uh, but my Python, I believe I updated it, but maybe still this is, maybe I don't have statistics library. Maybe I should download the statistics library. Okay. All right. So that is how you get the mean, median, and mode using NumPy and Skype. Any questions, any comments? Any questions, any comments? Okay, so if it is clear, we'll move to the next topic, which is dispersion of a distribution. So essentially, a, essentially a distribution should have a shape like this. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to capture that shape by knowing the center. And we've seen median and mode can help us in capturing the center. Now the next thing we'd like to see is the dispersion. It is how far it goes. What is the range of this? And this dispersion can come in different flavors, like it can be the range, the simple range, which is nothing but the max value, the difference between the max and min value, or it could be uh, interquartile range, IQR, interquartile range. You could also get variance or standard deviation to hint you about the dispersion. So this thing is a dispersion. This thing is the dispersion, and that is the center of the distribution. So knowing these uh, two, center and the dispersion, uh, can give you a better picture of the data. So looking at all the numbers, if you have millions of numbers, you cannot even look at all of them. And even if you look, you will not get anything. But at least getting these summaries, uh, this, this, you know, uh, summarized information in, in five, six numbers could be much, much useful, okay? And of course, the picture is also useful, no doubt. But apart from the picture, these numbers could be useful to summarize the data, to know what is going on in the data. So here we have dispersion, okay? And this is an extra one, let us remove that, okay. So dispersion basically means, uh, it, we're trying to find here how to measure the spread of the distribution, the spread that we just showed in the, in the purple line, okay, magenta line. Okay, as a measure of center, you know, it might not be, enough. center might not be enough. Uh, for example, here, uh, let me show you the picture. In this picture, you see all of them have the same center. But that is not enough because you can have different dispersions, okay. And for that, we need to calculate the dispersions as well. Dispersion could be calculated by different measures. Just like center, we have these standard measures, uh, the mean, median, mode. Okay, let me make them bold so that we... Mean, median, and mode. We also have here uh, different measures. For example, the range, the usual range, which is the minimum, maximum value minus minimum value. You have interquartile range. This is something I believe new, and we'll see that. Then you have the variance and standard deviation. Again, that's the same old story, okay? What is the range? It is the difference between the min and the max value. A range like average or mean is, is susceptible to the outliers. What do I mean by that? Um, for example, here, let us see. Uh, yeah. So if you have numbers like this, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, what is the range? 
the max mi minus the minimum. What will be that? Five. If I add here 600, the range will immediately change to yes. So you see, range is very susceptible to the outliers, it's exactly like your like your mean. Okay, but it is one way. If if you know the data is perfect, there is no outliers, then range is good. Otherwise, you have to get rid of those outliers. And like median, where the, you don't have much effect of the outliers, what we have is interquartile range. Okay, interquartile range. What's the idea here? The idea here is when you have the data, when you have the data, let's say the values goes like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, and 600. Okay, that was very bad, 600. Then, you know, looking at the number, this guy looks like completely off. Maybe something happened here or some exception. So for the data, you can come up with some cutoffs. You can come up with some cutoffs, okay? like some quartiles you can say okay like some quartiles and using that you can draw a range for outliers and you can say that everything beyond that is outliers and ignore and this gives you the interquartile range that gives you the interquartile range so what does this quartile is the percentile values for example let's say you arrange the data in increasing order and you have 100 data points let us say 100 data points then the 25th data point or the value at the 25th data point is a quartile one. Then the 50th data point is quartile two, which is exactly in the center. Okay, when you sort the data and get the center, the central value, what is, what is it? When you sort the data and get the value the, in the center, in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle, what is that value? That's the median, yes, okay. That's the median, which is same as the second quartile. So now you can see that from the median, somebody got the idea, or maybe vice versa, that you can also look at the first quartile, which is the first 25th value, and the first 75th value, which is the third quartile. So looking at this quartile, first and third quartile, the difference of the third minus the first, because this is high, this is low. So the difference between these two will give you another range that is called as interquartile range, IQR. Maybe we should somebody should make it capital Q, okay? But in the short form, it is IQR, interquartile range, IQR, okay? So this range is robust in the sense that if you have outliers, it will not be affected. It will not be affected. But whereas range, yes, now the range becomes 2000. It is very different, okay? So that is the interquartile range. And then apart from these two, you have a variance, which you know you must know this from your high school. Uh, variance is, is another measure to, to, to show the spread of the data. That's the formula for the variance. There are two formulas for the variance. One is the population variance. The other one is the sample variance. Okay. And uh, these are the formulas that can be used. Uh, for in our case, you know, we will just do use this uh, Python and also you can calculate it by hand using you know, Excel or simple calculations by hand. Okay, but these are the formulas for the variance and for the standard deviation. This is the formula. Once the variance is known, the square root of the variance is nothing but the standard deviation. Okay, so the variance is showing you how the spread of the data point is and the standard deviation shows you, you know, plus and minus the mean or plus or minus the center, how far the data can go. So these are the four measures, the four measures of dispersion, okay? Here is an example, uh, how to calculate the measures of dispersion by hand. Again, you have two variables, student ID and score. And for the score, we would like to calculate all of this. The range is very easy. The, you know, the maximum value is 100 and the value is, I think, 71. So the range will be 100 minus 71, 29. That's the range, the simple one. Uh, to calculate the variance in standard deviation, we have to use this formula. The formula, by the way, when you write it like this, it looks complicated, but it's very easy. And here, you know, is a nice picture to show how the formula works. So that's the score. And from here, I got the average, which is, I think, 88 point something, okay? 
Now in this line, what I'm doing is I'm taking each number and subtracting the average. I'm taking each number and subtracting the average. Okay, I'm taking each number and subtracting the average. And in this line, I'm doing the square of the previous. For example, if it's 9.44, I'm doing the square of that. And then I take the sum of all of these, sum of all of this, and divide it by either 25 or 24. If I divide it by 25, I get the population variance. If I divide it by 24, I get the sample variance. And it's your choice. If it is mentioned to do sample variance or population, use that. Otherwise, you can pick any or you can do both. Okay, And you get the variance. And once you have the variance, to get the standard deviation, just take the square root of that and you get the standard deviation. Okay. So in the next class, we will see how to calculate the interquartile range, IQR. Okay. And we will also see uh, how to solve all of this using Python. Okay. So let us stop here and we'll continue from here in the next class. Uh, do you have any questions, any comments, any doubts? Okay, now there's one thing regarding the quiz. Uh, I don't know if you guys have uh, thought of a time. Uh, for the other section, they all agreed to have the quiz on Sunday uh, evening. Yes, Hadi, you have any question, anything? Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, I asked the people in our WhatsApp group and most of us said that to, to be on Sunday and during our class time, if that's possible. Okay, so uh, maybe for your section, we can have it Sunday during class time. For the other section, there's, you know, there were some students who cannot make it in the class times. They had some uh, commitments. So uh, they agreed to have Sunday at 7 p.m. Okay, so uh, do you guys like to have it Sunday 7 p.m. or in class? Okay. All right, so we will have in Sunday in class uh, this quiz. Uh, it will be a 20 to 25 minutes quiz, okay? All right, so anything else? Okay, then. So let us stop here. Uh, we'll continue from here in the next class. Um, the office hours, the the survey i think last time i checked i didn't have 40 students and uh, maybe if there are more than 40 students 